Hello, and welcome back to Deviatus. Can you believe we are nearing 20 episodes here? And I hope you enjoyed last week's episode with Kathleen Maka. This week's guest is a photographer and researcher who claims to have developed a method for capturing ghosts and apparitions consistently on camera. He recently took a two-year tour of Williamsburg, Virginia, site of the largest collection of 18th century buildings in the United States. His book, Haunted Historic Colonial Williamsburg, Virginia, with breakthrough ghost photography, shows 230 images of ghost photography with his narrative explanations from 43 various locations throughout Williamsburg. Tim Scullion joins us on this week's episode of Deviatus. Tim, thank you for joining us on Deviatus, and welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. So I was really excited to speak with you today because I did read about your book on Amazon and immediately wondered if the techniques used for ghost photography would be something I myself could do. Um, without giving away too much from your book, can you elaborate at all on your technique? It is a bit convoluted, but uh, I'm not going to reveal specifics about the camera because my publisher wants me to make that the subject of another book. Okay. Um, and, and how about any particular post-processing, post-processing techniques? Well, well, there's not a lot of that, but um, one of the first things that I do is crank up the contrast, although sometimes doing that it can make the apparition appear a little bit cartoonish. It's just something that I can't help. If the photo gets too grainy, I try to take that out. Sometimes I have to do that by hand. Sometimes I can do it with uh, a setting in the software that I use. And sometimes I will use the um, lens aberration correction to sharpen up the photo. Other than that, there, there is no other post processing. Well, tell, tell us a little bit about the, um, uh, you said it was two years you spent, um, you know, touring this area. Uh, what, what drove you to do that, and, and how did you work that out? Was it two years actually living there, or did you travel to and from there? Well, I've lived in Colonial Williamsburg for quite a long time, and uh, a few years ago, 2011 to be exact, I was working as a tour guide in the historic triangle, and for those of uh, your listeners that don't know, that's the cities of Williamsburg, Jamestown, and Yorktown. So in addition to being the tour guide, given history during the daytime, I was asked to do ghost tours a couple evenings a week in Colonial Williamsburg. And the tours were based on the books by a man named L.B. Taylor. So during these ghost tours, every once in a while, someone would get an anomaly on a cheap cell phone. And keep in mind that we're talking 2011, because I know that the... Uh, photo-taking abilities of cell phones has uh, advanced quite a bit. So I figured that if a random person could take a picture and capture anomalies or ghosts or apparitions or whatever you'd like to call it, what would happen if I would take my professional-grade photography equipment? So over the winter, beginning about 2012, when tourism dies in Williamsburg, I began to experiment with cameras, settings, lens, and all the typical adjustments that uh, professional photographers are used to making. So my goal was to consistently be able to capture a ghost on camera. And let me make a caveat that when I began this, I was highly skeptical because I had never had a any kind of an encounter with a ghost, any paranormal experience at all. So I I was kind of thinking that this wasn't going to work. And in fact, the very first time that I went out, it was a complete failure. But uh, I'm not the type of person to give up. So the next time we, I went out, I captured something over Bruton Parish Church. And that, that was a building that was built in 1715. So it's been there quite a long time. And it was a colored light formation, something that looked akin to um, a decorative fountain in colored lights. 
not it's not your standard gray colored orb that you see on the internet. So how how would you? I mean, this is a question I was going to plan on asking later, but since we brought up the orb, um, how would you determine the difference between you know something that shows up that might be dust out of focus uh, versus you know what one would consider an orb or a ball of light? I've got uh, s several things that I have to answer to that, and. Uh, First off, let, let me make it perfectly clear that I, I'm not, my book does not have these uh, small gray colored orbs that you see on the internet. These things are very different. They are um, geo light formations is what I call them because they, they're different geometric shapes and they have different colors of light, different colors from different ends of the spectrum. And uh, let me give you an example. When I first discovered them, this was in the winter now, they had a concave shape and it was similar to um, either a decorative fountain or if you know what a fiber optic light is, that's, that's the kind of that shape it was. And it was in the blue-green side of the spectrum. Now, one time I went in the springtime and every single one of these shapes that were appearing over houses had all changed. So it was no longer a concave, but it was a spherical shape. And it looked like it had a, a little torch light on the top of the sphere. So I thought that originally that this might be an energy-conserving measure for the colder months because it happened in the spring, and when it changed to a sphere, it went to different colors of light. It went from the blue-green end of the spectrum to the red-orange-yellow end of the spectrum. So that was my original summation, hypothesis, whatever you want to call it. But I have since determined that uh, that may not be the case because I have seen the concave shape in the middle of summer. So I'm not quite sure why that changed. But there are some other reasons why I'm, I would say that... Uh, this is not controversial. First thing is movement. I see these things moving. I've captured them moving. Second thing is that they shape shift. In addition to the seasonal change that I thought occurred, they will shape in subsequent captures, you know, a few seconds apart. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I've discovered now, some people would call these things lens flares. And my answer to that is that there is a difference because there's a specific chain of patterns that occurs, and they are consistent in shape and color. So it's unlike a random sequence that you would see in a lens flare on television. And uh, in, this, in my second book, which I've already written, I had this map, mapped out showing these specific shapes and showing the minor differences in the appearance and the shape. Because each apparition, although it has similar shapes and colors, has its own unique qualities, it's sort of like a, a fingerprint. Are you still there? I'm still here. I heard a doubt and that's why I wasn't sure. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I was... I'm kind of, every once in a while, I'll let out a noise, and it's, it's me showing I'm interested. I'm just, I just kind of went, huh. Um, you know, you're making me think here. Uh, are, are these things that you are visibly witnessing outside of the lens of the camera or, or the final photograph? Say it, it again. I, somebody's trying to call me. Are you witnessing these things with your eyes in addition to on the camera? No. I have no psychic abilities, so I can't see anything with my eyes. I have taken people out in my family that uh, do have psychic abilities, and they can see them. Now, this is not all the time, just every once in a while. And um, they'll point out places where they see something. And although I can't see with the naked eye, I will be able to take a picture of it and capture it on film, and it's exactly what they see. Now, do you do you feel like uh, these things that you're capturing on still photographs can also be uh, 
caught with video? No, uh, not as they appear, but I'm experimenting with that. See, I'm currently living in a haunted house. Now, my house is on the outskirts of the Civil War battlefield, the Battle of Williamsburg. And uh, we have several ghosts here. One of them is a Union soldier, and another one is a gentleman that uh, appears in a black suit. And uh, I have a security camera, and it has infrared capabilities, and I have it named aimed at the hallway at the front door, and every once in a while, instead of just bright orbs that are streaking across the camera, I will see a very pixelated human form or forms that appear to be walking down the hallway or up the steps. Mm -hmm. And so I, I believe that there are capabilities with the video camera, but it's still not going to make an appearance like the photos that I get on the still camera. Now, um, did you live in this house prior to your to your two years spent um, doing the the tour for the photography book? No. Uh, so this I is was, kind uh, of new new stuff for you li living in a, a haunted house. No, actually, it isn't because the previous house was haunted too. See, in the previous house, I lived off of a road that it had been used by four different armies. Uh, the Revolutionary War, it had uh, the armies of George Washington and General Lafayette and General Rochambeau and also the British troops that were under General Cornwallis. And then later on in the Civil War, the uh, Confederate troops and the Union troops used that road. So uh, it was quite a busy road, and uh, there are skirmishes along the way, and so I believe that some of the ghosts that we had at that house were due to uh, the wars and the armies that were marching up and down that road. Okay. Well, I think uh, my audience would not be pleased with me if I didn't push a little harder on the uh, photographic evidence you've captured. Um, was there ever a time that you thought, these things might simply be explainable artifacts on the exposures. Uh, can you walk me through any steps you took to further confirm that they weren't? Any steps? Um, All right. Did it even cross your mind? Did you think that it might be something that, you know, maybe there's a smudge on my lens or maybe... I don't know, There's you, you compared it to kicking up some dust and taking photographs of that. I know you did well, explain in detail the difference between, you know, what dust would look like versus, uh, you know, what you were seeing. Right. Well, first off, you have, you have to keep in mind that um, I'm using very expensive photographic equipment, and I also keep it very clean, and I'm very, I'm very fussy and careful about how I use the equipment. So I don't believe there's any dust that uh, is going to uh, be an explanation for these things. Maybe a little gray orb, yes, that uh, these these larger, multicolored, geometrically shaped apparitions, no. And, and let me elaborate. I don't just get those geometrically shaped, different colored light forms formations. I also get uh, two other types. See, I've, I've ca classified the uh, photographs into three different categories. The one is the geolite type apparition. The second is a classic white, and by that I mean it's a uh, white Halloween type ghost that uh, may have limited features. So it'll be something like uh, a Casper type ghost or one of his friends. You're going to usually see two eyes. Sometimes you'll see a nose-like structure, sometimes a mouth. Maybe, maybe not. And it sort of looks white, filmy, ephemeral. You can usually partially see through that. So that's the classic white. And then the other type of apparitions, which I have many in my book, 
are the phantom faces, and they are recognizable human faces, rarely accompanied by a body. If I if I get the whole person, I consider that uh, very lucky. Yeah, I've seen some of the um, photos on the Amazon page that you, you do have a mix of those, at least that, that you can view before buying. Well, let, let me let me say that. Uh, the photos that my publisher decided to put up on the Amazon page are not the best photos by a long shot. Oh wow! I wish I would have been. Con- I wish I would have been contacted and asked about which photos I would like to have put up because I certainly could have done a better job of getting uh, some more interesting photos of these ghosts up. What would you say is the majority? You've given us three classifications, basically, of what you've captured with, you know, room for kind of variation within those. What would be the majority of what you captured in, uh, throughout the book? Well, I, I can't answer that as far as the, the pictures in the book because I've taken – for this book, over 10,000 photographs, okay? And, and that was within a two-year time frame. But I've chosen the very best of those 10,000 photographs. And there's 230 photographs in the book. And I try to uh, keep it so that there is a minimum of the geolite formations and there's a maximum of the recognizable human faces because that seems to be what people are really interested in. Have, did you, uh, throughout your creation of, of these photos that went into the book, had, had you experimented with using uh, IR or what, you know, what you see as uh, full-spectrum photography on some of the shows that are out there? Yes, I, I've tried that, and I can say without a doubt that uh, infrared and full-spectrum will definitely improve your chances of capturing anomalies. But keep this in mind. I used for three quarters of the photos in this book a visible spectrum camera. Okay. Wow, that's that's quite a bit. Um, it is. Let, let me ask you a little bit, going back to before your trip to Williamsburg, um, or maybe the beginning of this project, what kind of research did you do, if any, um, to prepare yourself for that trip? Did, did you say research? Uh-huh. Like research into maybe determining the locations you wanted to photograph specifically? Well, uh, first off, I had already had the background from giving the evening ghost tours. So, so I knew where the most famous ghost stories had come from the, the different buildings. And um, one thing I also want to emphasize is that, that I'm not retelling Taylor's book. That I'm trying, I tried to find new stories and new places to write about. So with that caveat, um, I had to do some historical background research, and I would like to give credit to Colonial Williamsburg's historians because they're my source for all, all the historical information that, that I have. Now, as far as some of the uh, ghost tales for some of these buildings, I was able to talk to, excuse me, some of the some of the people that worked in Colonial Williamsburg. Some of them were very forthcoming, and others were very guarded, because from what I understand, at least before the current president. If you were caught telling ghost stories, that was grounds for firing. So you were not allowed to uh, admit to anybody that Colonial Williamsburg was actually haunted. I, I didn't know that. So yeah. did, did you? Some, some people were still under the under that uh, guise that uh, there's a possibility that their job might be in jeopardy if they say anything. So they're very cautious. And is that with just with the historical society, or did you find that to be the case with, with other, uh, you know, places of employment out there? 
say that again? I said, did you find that to be the case with just, like, the historical society or the people that you got some of your research from, or was that applicable in some of the other careers out there? Well, the I did not talk to the people about the historical research. That that was done through the books and online. Okay. So that had nothing to do with the um, ghost stories that I was soliciting. So the ghost stories that I was trying to find something new and different, and so I had to get, go talk to people. But uh, obviously the history is not going to change, and so I would go to uh, – written forth as for that information. Okay. Now, did you, in, in your two years, two years there, uh, did you find any particular locations in Williamsburg that uh, had better conditions for the type of photography you're doing? Well, initially I discovered that uh, the place where I found my very first apparition, which was the Bruton Parish Church in the graveyard, that was a great location. It was a hotbed. But I've since found out that most churches have a plethora of paranormal activity around them. Not all, but most of them. But that said, uh, some of the other places were the Peyton Randolph House, which is, it has long been considered Williamsburg's most haunted. And I might add in a malevolent way. And also the ancient campus of the College of William and Mary. And that's where the three buildings there were built in the 1700s. Actually, the Wren building was built, started in 1695, but it later burned down and it was built in the, rebuilt in the early 1700s. Well, did you happen to witness paranormal activity while you were there? Um, you know, you were there two years, and you got a lot of photographs, but as far as personal experiences, like noises, objects moving, or, or seeing apparitions with your own eyes? Well, the most frequent occurrence that I had happened at the Peyton Randolph's house and at the jail. And it was the presence, I felt the presence of the ghost by the cold chills down my neck and on my arms, and every little hair would be standing straight up. And and let me add that, by the way, I've done some background research, and I do not believe that ghosts are cold creatures, but I do believe that what they're doing is actually absorbing the energy from our bodies when they get near us. And so the escaping heat energy makes you feel like you're cold. And... Since then, I've been tapped on my shoulder. I've had my hair flipped and in a place with no flowers, which was another church I met, my dad. I smelled the scent of lavender. And how often would you say that happened to you? Well, the lavender scent only happened one time, but um, the tapping, um, every few times that I go out, I feel something like that. Well, it, let's say hypothetically I wanted to take my camera out. I, I have kind of one of those little point and clicks, and I have a you know a entry level DSLR. Um, what advice would you give me if I wanted to go out and either scout an ideal location, uh, or you know what? I, I guess I'm asking you to walk me through the process that you took in selecting these locations. We'll see. I I have a different reason from somebody that's going out and scouting and trying to find ghosts. I I chose a place because they have an interesting or compelling story. And whether that place would land in my book depended on how good of photographs that I got. Some of the places that I didn't expect to get anything, I got some amazing photographs and vice versa. Now, if you want to take your uh, point and shoot or, or DSLR camera out, the only thing I can say is to have patience and persistence because the ghosts don't always come out when you want them to. 
see. You mentioned to me uh, recently being in North Carolina uh, when we were talking before we started recording. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you were doing there and, and the project you're working on with that? Well, I'm continuing. See, I've already written my second book. Originally, I thought that uh, I would publish it all at once, but uh, my publisher explained that the cost would be so prohibitive, so it divided it up into three different parts. And um, the second part is finished, and I'm, I'm working on the third part right now. And so I've expanded my search from just Colonial Williamsburg into the southeast, southeastern Virginia and also the Outer Banks of North Carolina. And the reason why that place is so interesting is because it's had so many shipwrecks. It's called the Graveyard of the Atlantic, and it's had well over a thousand shipwrecks there. And so it's naturally going to be a hotbed for paranormal activity. And I, I've seen some of the places that uh, do have paranormal activity, and in fact, what, what was interesting is I photographed a couple lighthouses in the daytime, not expecting to get anything but a nice photograph of the the lighthouse for not not for any books, but just for my own personal collection. And I got ghosts on those, so wow. that that convinced me to uh, add the Outer Banks. But in fact, on one of them which was the Currituck Lighthouse in Kerala, I I thought the um, stairway going up made an interesting pattern to photograph. It would be a great architectural piece. And so looking straight up, I photographed it, and what I discovered was at the top, looking down at me, was a bald man with a beard. He's looking right over the stairway at me from the top of the lighthouse. And so that convinced me that uh, I've got some more more places to look at on North Carolina's outer banks. I might also add that uh, I got some amazing pictures over the ocean, and it totally flabbergasted me. Uh, on the first photograph that I took, it was absolutely clear. Now, this is at night, I might add. And I was just trying to get a starry night. And then on the second photograph, a very ephemeral group of, must be about 20 or 30 faces showed up. And so that tweaked my interest as far as the Outer Banks goes. And I'm going to be going back down and doing a lot more photography, trying to get a lot more things there. Wow. I look forward to, to seeing that when it comes out. Um, if, if you're going to be including that in your next book, or, well, you said you already wrote your next one, but maybe a third, possibly. Yes. Um, well, I want to be really respectful of your time. Uh, before we sign off, uh, where can people go to check out your book and connect with you about your uh, current and future projects? Well, I'm on most of the social media. I'm at uh, Twitter. I've Tim Scully in 43, and the reason why I used that number, that was my birthday, and because there's a, another Tim Scully in, in London, England, so I couldn't just use my name. Ah, I gotcha. And I've got an author page on Facebook. I've got an Instagram account. And let's see, Instagram. Oh, Amazon. I've written other books besides the ghost books on Amazon, so if you just type my name into a search, you'll find out. Excellent. Well, I'll certainly put all of those links in my show notes for uh, our audience. And, um, Tim, thanks again so much. I, I found this very interesting, and I, I look forward to seeing your work. And thank you. All right, guys, you know the next part. I'm going to be putting all of today's show notes on deviatus.com slash scullion. That's S-C-U-L-L-I-O-N. If you would do me a huge favor, 
Um, you know, I, I recognize that the audio quality is not always the best whenever I do a phone interview. Sometimes in order to get an interview with people that I really want to speak with, I'm not always given the luxury of doing these interviews over Skype, which has superb audio quality. Uh, right now, the way I'm doing it is a little bit different. It's, it's more of a compressed audio version, and obviously there's, there's some suffering and quality there. But um, let me know. I, if you would give me some comments on my website, uh, particularly under this episode, let me know if the audio quality is something that is just really a big turnoff to you. Like, would, are you turning off the show when I have these phone calls on here uh, versus the audio quality I get from Skype for a majority of the episodes? This is one of those where I was kind of on the fence for putting it out there, but I think with your feedback, you can help me make the decision of whether or not to include these types of interviews in the future. I'm on the fence, so be the deciding factor for me. This is where you have a voice in the future creation of the show and, and what goes on here. And as usual, if you have any guest suggestions or if, if there's somebody that uh, you know of that has their own personal experience or, or maybe yourself, please feel free to contact me at deviatuspod at gmail.com. I'd like to start having some more personal experiences on the show with the paranormal, whether it be uh, spirits, ghosts, shadow figures, black-eyed children, UFOs and aliens, uh, any sort of cryptid, anything like that. So if, if you have your own story or know somebody that might be willing to sit down and chat with me very informally, um, let me know. Shoot me an email. Uh, send me a comment or a direct message on my Instagram or Twitter at DeviatusPod. And I don't even mind if you keep it anonymous. I just love to hear this stuff. And I know that people who listen to this show do as well. So again, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Tim Scullion. And you guys have a great week. Music